Have a seat on your porcelain throne. It's time to talk some shit on the Powell Movement. Welcome to the Powell Movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and this week I have a bona fide ski celebrity on the show. I'm talking about the one and only Glenn Plake. Now, I have interviewed Plake more than almost anyone, I think, and we've talked about so many topics. So to make this show interesting, I had to make sure we kept the conversation fresh. I mean, I could rehash all the things we've talked about before, and the way Glenn tells stories, it would still make for an entertaining podcast. But what we talk about on this episode, for the most part, is totally new information from a dude who is arguably the most important skier of our time. My real plan for this podcast was to chat with Glenn for a bit and then talk to his ride or die, Kimberly, and get her backstory as Kimberly's is pretty incredible too. I mean, she was able to tame the beast known as Glenn Plake. But after two hours of shooting the shit with Glenn on Friday night while he was sitting in his RV in his driveway, I realized I would never have this edit ready if I recorded for another hour. So Kimberly will be a guest in the future, and this week we'll focus on all things Glenn. Before we get into the podcast, I want to ask you to do a few things for me. The first is subscribe to the podcast and tell your friends who like snow to do the same. Next, I want you to follow me on Instagram, at the Powell Movement. And finally, I'd like you to support my amazing sponsors who make this show happen. They are Evo, Stanley, Spy Optic, 686, and the 10 Barrel Brewery. Now, let's talk to a living legend, Glenn Plake. Did you say you were on an iPhone 5? Yeah. I wish I had my iPhone 1. That's my favorite one. When are you going to upgrade your phone, given that it's 2020 now and you've had your phone for three decades? I don't know. I don't really like the big giant phone thing, you know. They're too freaking big and obnoxious. They're annoying me more and more and more. (laughs) How often is a guy like you on your phone? Do you use it for internet and are you on it a couple hours a day or do you try to use it as little as possible? I hate using phones for cameras. I can't stand it. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. I remember when we got ingenue lenses, you know, for the helmet cam. And I know when Greg got his power zoom 240. And I remember taking the time to clean lenses and everything. And then everybody walks around with these stupid phones, taking pictures with a lens smaller than my fingernail. That's me. Just drives me crazy. It's great. It's awesome. But compared to a a lens. (laughs) So I don't need a phone to take a picture really. And then I try not to use it too much for the GPS thing because again, I, I'd rather use something else, but I like it for a phone. Yeah. In texting with Kimberly, she was saying that you have a lot to say. Oh gosh. Yes. No, maybe. I don't know. I think I'm about ready to quit saying anything because it's just my own frustrations, I guess. So. <laughs> I've been jamming pretty hard last couple of days. And now uh, we're getting ready to head to Europe. And I hate transition. Transition's so hard for me. I love being somewhere and I hate leaving. And I don't really care where I am in particular. Just transitions in general are hard. Unless transitions are part of the trip when you're on like expedition then it's fine. You know, you're moving and grooving every day, moving and grooving every day. But yeah, we've been in the truck for the last seven weeks and now we're about ready to go live in a home, which is kind of cool, actually. I don't have to worry about where my electricity is coming from. (laughs) (laughs) But transition is like your whole life. I mean, I know I'm trying to get your time and I'm like one dude. I know you're all right. But there's so many people out there that want a piece of your time. And this week, I think you were with a (laughs) camera crew and in a regular week, how much time do you get to yourself? I do all right, you know, and I do my thing. You know, everybody always wonders why I'm such a motorhead or what happens. And, and that's just when it's just me. I'm just unhooking. I'm down in the shop doing something. And at the same time, I'll turn around when I get to Chamonix, I'll go out and get my skiing in. And it's just the way it is. You know, I do my thing. I think that's why I probably don't do as much social media as somebody else would, just because I'm so busy doing it. I don't need to produce it. I don't need to build a reputation. I have to live up to the one I already have. I don't need to waste my time or energies building something up. I'm proud of what I built up. Now I just have to continue. You know, does that make sense? It totally makes sense. To answer your question, yeah, I get my time, but at the same time, we give a lot too. And that's just part of it. Biggest problem is just like piles of crap everywhere. 
(laughs) (laughs) I'm a real neat Nick when it comes to certain things. Like, you know, my toolbox is impeccably clean and all these things are in order. And yet my closet is hundreds of t-shirts and I can't even put another one in there. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, why do I have all these (laughs) t-shirts? I got to figure out what to do with hats. I feel bad. I don't want to get rid of them, but I don't know what to do with them all. I just spent an hour of going through the truck and transitioning some stuff from the truck to the house to the bag that I'm carrying to Chamonix. This is the big problem of the day. Real terrible. Friggin', huh? Terrible. What a terrible thing to have to live with. <laughs> Too much stuff and trying to get it into one spot to get over to Chamonix. <laughs> That's pretty funny. So I started winter at Mammoth. It was phenomenal. I mean, ever since Thanksgiving, and I'm not a big fan of early ski season. You know, I kind of let winter come and it came and Thanksgiving weekend, it started snowing and literally the last six weeks, it couldn't have been better. Just kept snowing and we got abnormally cold temperatures and east winds and it kept the snow really, really, really nice. And it's just been a great beginning actually for me. But like I said before, I mean, if you told me I didn't ski a day in December, it wouldn't bother me. Whatever. But don't take away May or April, (laughs) especially May. Well, I do have a bunch of questions, so you don't have to just jump around and talk. That sounds good to me. I need questions. Yeah, yeah. Kimberly said you had a lot of stuff to say, so I figured you might just want to say stuff in the beginning, but I can handle it from here to get us talking. So this year, you were in a Warren Miller movie, Timeless, and you've been in Warren Miller movies back in the day. And back then, it was like sponsors would pay a pretty penny to ensure you're in a movie. (laughs) But this year, I think the way you get into the movie is a little bit different. It wasn't like a team manager calling you up and saying, hey, Plake, we're sponsoring Warren Miller and we want you to be in the segment. How does this one come together? In a way, that happened. (laughs) Kind of. But in this case, my team manager was actually Nick Heron, who's the president or CEO of PSIA. And Nick got a hold of me and said, hey, Glenn, PSIA is doing a segment in the Warren Miller movie, and we would like you to represent us as a PSIA, not only member, but certified instructor and an examiner now. He called me up and said, what do you think? And I said, yeah, that sounds awesome, especially once I heard the details and the way we went up to Mustang Powder Cats and had like five gorgeous weather days up there and got to ski that facility and What a great operation, and more importantly, to represent PSIA in a light that needs to be seen and needs to be seen more often, actually, from that. So it was a great honor, and that's how I got in. So, yes, it kind of was a team manager move, you know, in a way, in a weird way. (laughs) You're getting back onto the horse, really, filming with Warren Miller, but you're globally famous for your shooting with Greg Stump back in the day. Yeah, we hated Warren Miller. We almost had him on the grave, dude. We had him one foot in it for sure. He was freaking. They were all freaking out. Because you guys were so different? Yeah. I mean, we had them all freaking out. We had good music. We had good skiing. We had stuff. I don't know. For whatever reason, I'm not going to point any fingers, but you know, we never were able to evolve the way we could have and continue to evolve the way we could have for various reasons that I may or may not get into. But I kind of went for it. You know, the door opened and, and my career blossomed. And many of us in and around and associated with the film, Bruce Benedict used it as a step. And Greg did too, to an extent, but become what we could have become from that standpoint. I'm proud of all of our individual potentials, but I, I am not happy with the potential that we could have reached as a group, as a production company. I think we could have done a lot more. And with that said, Warren Miller was freaking. They were shitting themselves. Stumpy, he's like a mad genius. He helped change the genre of films. He created a vision. He had a lot of amazing assets, but was he batshit crazy to work with? No, not really. I mean, later times, you know, the biggest problem that kind of split us all up was during Greg's time, for the most part, the movie itself was sponsored or that's the way it was being hooked up back then was, you know, the movie itself was being sponsored and opportunities came my way. I went down my own road. I chose my own skis. I chose my own boots. I chose my own bindings. I chose my own clothes because I was working to, let's say, better myself through these opportunities. And the films continued to be sponsored by ABC. And if you didn't ski on ABC, well, you weren't in the film. 
And if you really look close at Dr. Strange Glove, I am not skiing on the products that that film wanted me to be skiing on. I've got a really, really funny old voice message that I've saved for years and years and years and years. I don't know what I've ever do with it. I got to find it and I'll let you play it in a podcast someday. I think I know where it is. But it's like Greg telling me like, <laughs> okay, here's what we're going to do. You're just going to ski in all your own equipment. And when the movie comes out, screw them. They'll find out you didn't. But by then, all the bills have been paid and hell with them. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty funny, actually. <laughs> because, like I said, you know, I kind of was starting to get my own sponsors there. Again, back then, you know, the film would be sponsored by something where nowadays it's tolerated for everybody to have their own personal equipment on. Yep. So by me wearing my personal equipment, it made it difficult, you know, to be in some of Greg's films after the fact of them becoming popular. And then let's talk about, I mean, from a theatrical presentation, that's what the Warren Miller movie is all about. Sit down, everybody gets together, everybody has a hoot, you sit at the theater, you watch the new Warren Miller movie, and you get the prizes, and you do the draw, and you do the raffle. And to be honest, I even try to narrate one of them live, to tell you the truth like Warren used to do. And let's face it, like John Jay used to do, because that's who Warren Miller stole the idea from. Okay. (laughs) But now I'm breaking out the history books. But if you want to watch a real Warren Miller movie, you would watch a John Jay film. Remember, we weren't fans of him. He was the enemy. John Jay was cool. Barrymore was cool. Roger Brown was cool. And then Greg Stump was cool. That's the genealogy of a Stump film right there. And with Stumpy this year or last year, he was able to put together the a national tour for the 30th anniversary of Blizzard. Mm-hmm. And I think there was a big event at Squaw where he, he had the whole crew together. What was it like getting the band back together and kind of reliving that moment? It was cool to get everybody out skiing around. One of the big retailers put it together and brought in a bunch of people. And I think my proudest moment of that during that whole thing was you had myself, you had Mike, and you had Scott together. And up on stage and out skiing around, you had three guys that have gone on to do, you know, our own individual lives in light of the stump films. But at the same time, you saw three guys that are still very, very healthy, very, very active. We are not beat up. We go out and we do our thing. And I think physically, that was the coolest thing about that was to see us all alive and well and physically capable. Still crushing it. All of you. And I even had some people come up to me after the fact and say, it's cool to see you guys up there, you know, because that was not the road we were supposed to go on if you, you know, look at the old films. For sure. And when you think back to that era of your career, I mean, there's been a lot of highlights, but is that Blizzard period the highlight of your career or is it just the start for you? No, it's not the highlight. It was literally the start for me. It was the official start of the career. And if you have to look at from like a 30,000 foot view at all the shit that you've done throughout your career and pick a high point of a few years, where would that fit in the Glenn Plake career? The high points of my career? I mean, there's a lot of them. They're all stepping stones upon each other. Yeah, okay. Blizzard was by all means a high point. Of course, it, it, it introduced me to Chamonix. It changed my life. It gave me every opportunity that I always wanted and finally got. And because of that, the down-home tour could take place. But now, is the Blizzard more important than the down-home tour? Oh, I think over the time, I think my down-home tours have actually outshined the Blizzard, to be very honest. Hmm. Certainly from personal interaction, and yes, okay, Blizzard comes, but by the time, there's other things now. There's other forms of me, whether it's other films, or whether it's other uh, articles, or whether it's other activities, or You know, all these different things, again, they're all stepping stone upon each other and none of them happen, let's say, without the other. You know, each door opens up another door, I guess. That makes sense. And for people who are listening to the podcast, I've done a ton of them with Glenn and I encourage everyone to check out the Best of Plague episode. (laughs) We've talked about so many things that you've done, Mm -hmm. but we're going to talk about things that we haven't talked about before on this podcast. And one thing I'm curious too is when you're able to get away from skiing, you have other passions. I know you're into water skiing and cars. Yeah. And we'll talk about cars in a minute, but what else do you do when you're not on the water or behind the wheel or in the mountains? Uh, I mean, do you go to the movies? (laughs) No, I don't go to the movies much. (laughs) 
I work around the house a lot. You know, I, I haven't chosen the easiest path. You know, we chose to build a road to the property that we bought a long time ago. We chose to install solar systems. We chose to build everything for the house in the desert on its own. At the same time, we choose to live and travel in a truck during our North American winter. So I always joke around, you know, those dang shirts, those live simple shirts. Well, my motto is live complex. And instead of a freaking ukulele with a broken string, I got a double barred Judas Priest freaking guitar with 12 on one and six on the other. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, let's say skiing or like you said, water skiing or playing with one of the hot rods or something. It's just the life in general keeps me busy. Do you have any hidden talents that the world doesn't know about? Like, oh, Plague's a great golfer, or he can bowl a 300, or he can juggle, or he can do just shit that we wouldn't know because we only think about you as skiing, cars, and water skiing. <laughs> My first answer to that, and now in light of some of the stuff that was on Truck Night in America, most people didn't realize that I'm a very, very talented mechanic. Yes. <laughs> and I'm, I'm really proud of that. So that would be, let's say, my hidden talent that most people don't, you know, they're, what? What the heck's that all about? <laughs> that's about it, I guess. I mean, I don't know. That's kind of a hidden one. But you, like you said, it's not hidden anymore in a lot of the last couple of years. Prior to that, that would have been my hidden. Um, as far as, no, I don't play the guitar or anything like that. I wish you could. But you're born into the wrenching kind of thing. It sounds like you learn how to drive at age seven and then you drive like heavy farm machinery from like the time you're eight years old and older. I think I learned how to drive before that, actually. But yeah, for sure. By then. Yeah, yeah, probably six or seven. Did they just let you kind of go ham on your farm with whatever you wanted to drive? No, there was a purpose to my driving. OK, it was whether it was steering the truck so grandpa could do something or no it wasn't like i just well actually i take that back i did go fang around a little bit <laughs> <laughs> but yeah no i guess i mean i don't know yeah i drive trucks i drive whatever i mean drive 18 wheelers i drive anything i don't care what's the first car do you get that's yours i was forced to drive junk i guess by default i've never really had anything new i'm always driving something that i gotta work on or fix up Sometimes by choice, sometimes by necessity. To answer your question, my first truck or my first car was a 1959 Chevrolet half ton Apache. I still have it. Was that the truck that you didn't have and you were able to, by some act of God, find it? Yeah, yeah. I lost it. I lost it for like 16 years. And everybody was always driving by, hey, you want to sell that truck? You want to sell this truck? One guy, one day, some guy got my soft spot and I went, yeah, go ahead, take it. And give me a couple hundred bucks and didn't think nothing of it. Did you get shot at it in that car too? Oh, yeah. <laughs> What's the story behind you getting shot at? Oh, gosh, dude. You know, when you're a kid and you're getting in trouble or whatever, you, you're deemed uncontrollable. So you get shipped off to go live with your grandparents or your father or whoever the heck it is. And in my case, it was down to my grandparents. So next thing I know, I'm like living in the Central Valley. And I, I was only probably down there for six or seven months, but I quickly got into some really bad company. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, next thing you know, I'm driving through a bad neighborhood in Modesto at the time after getting in a fight. And the next thing you know, yeah, pistols coming through the window and shots are going through the cab and going out the front windshield. The guy I was with pulled me down and so they didn't hit me in the head, basically. <laughs> Damn, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it was actually super crazy. Yeah, all I heard was, he's got a gun, and he pulled me off to the side. The next thing you know, shots fired, and then my windshield went out. Anyways, uh, yeah, so that old truck, it's kind of funny. I mean, obviously, that's a wild memory, but I also used to drive it all the time down to Mexico and all over the place. In the early days of windsurfing, you know, I'd wind chase all over the place in that old truck, and yeah, whatever, and finally kind of left it for dead, and somebody bought it, and yeah, whatever. And then I was always pissed that I sold it a whole time. I'm like, gosh dang it, why? I mean, what, what, what for? Why did I sell that stupid thing? It could have rotted out in the yard for the rest of my life. Who gives a dang? It wasn't about the money. And I got laid over in Seattle, and they said, go ahead and turn on your phones, and Craigslist had just come out, and I was like, I like looking at want ads. I'm going to look at some want ads. <laughs> <laughs> or OBOs as I call them. So I'm staring at the OBOs and 
looking at garbage and I see this 59 Chevy pickup and I'm like, man, I wish I would have never sold that. I'm so bummed. I you know, kind of thinking to myself. And the next thing I know, I realize the one that is for sale is in fact my old truck. I had a bunch of old stickers, a bunch of punk rock stickers and a bunch of old bicycle racing stickers that I covered the inside of the cab with. And in the ad, it says, uh, you know, a little rough, blah, 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 blah. Has very interesting stickers on the inside, would make a neat rat rod. I'm like, what the heck's that all about? And I look and I realize that I'm staring at my old truck. So it was pretty funny. I came home that night and I told Kimberly, I said, guess, guess what I think I found? She's like, what? I'm, I showed her a picture and she's like, when are we leaving? I said, I already hooked up the trailer. I think we should go in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so I drove. <laughs> So we drove way up in Northern California. It had been, gone through three or four different hands since then and kind of cut a deal with the guy. And I never, ever told him it was mine. I'm like, ah, oh, it's kind of cool, you know, pretty beat, blah, blah, blah. And he said he didn't have any paperwork with it. And when I sold it, I couldn't find the pink slip. I knew I had the pink slip, but I couldn't find it. And I told the guy, I said, give me half the money now and then give me the rest later. Come by next week and I'll give you the pink slip and then off you go. Well, he never came back by because... You know, obviously he never needed the pink slip. All he was going to do was strip parts out of it. Cause when I got it back, it didn't have a dashboard. It was missing a few things. And so I think he just bought it for parts. Anyways, blah, 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 blah. We get it all done. And I go, so you got no pink slip for this thing. He's like, no, uh, but it's all punched out of the record. You know, we can go down to the sheriff right now and get a bill of sale deal drawn up. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, we could probably do that. Uh, he goes, are you going to register? What are you going to use it for parts? I'm no, I, I think I might put it back out on the road. It's like, yeah, it can be done. You know, you just reestablish this. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I go, so we're cool, right? That thing's sitting on my trailer. You and me have cut a deal, right? And he's like, yeah. And I said, okay, well, I need to tell you something. <laughs> and he goes, what's that? And I go, well, you know, you've told me that this truck came from Nevada and you think it's this and you tell us this and this and this and this. Let me tell you the real story about that pickup truck. And he's like, what? And he's kind of got this quizzical look and he's a nice guy, you know, hot rod guy. I go, that truck was bought, blah, blah, blah. It was part of a Santa Rita County jail. My grandfather bought that truck, da, 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 da. And I go, and I should have no problem registering it because, and I pulled the pink slip out of my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. And he was like, what? And I was like, he's like, now this poor guy's just complete like, whoa, whoa, whoa. start over again. What's going on? <laughs> I go, this is the pink slip to that truck. I lost it about 10, 15 years ago, and it's pretty funny. Now here it is, and I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but it's going back into my yard, and that's pretty funny. And the guy's just like, that is so cool, man. That is so cool. And I beat him down pretty good, and he was definitely didn't want to let it go, but you know, he was like, ah, heck with it. You know, you got a trailer, let's go. And I said, I'm paying way more than I sold it for, but whatever. It's one of those things. <laughs> now it is time for me to take a quick sponsor break. And my first sponsor is Evo, and they are a place I started shopping at way before they started supporting my podcast. Why? Because Evo does it all. Online, they have the best deals on the interwebs, and they offer free shipping on orders over $50, a low price guarantee, and the no-hassle return policy makes it easy to send things back if you have to. They also have stores in Seattle, Portland, Denver, Whistler, and I've been reading a whole lot about a Salt Lake City location in the works. In store. You are going to find all the brands, all the products, art, and a lot of passionate people who want to help you get dialed in for your next adventure. And for listening to the show, I've got a new deal from Evo for you on all Evo branded products. And everything they make is just as good or better than the big brand stuff. To get the deal, head on over to Evo.com, shop the branded products. When you check out, enter the code POWELL20. That's all one word and you'll save 20% on your Evo stuff. My next sponsor is Stanley, another iconic Seattle brand that has been ahead of the curve since 1913. While we all know Stanley for creating those iconic green bottles that kept your grandpa's coffee hot all day long, they still do that, and a whole lot more these days. They still are all about adventure, and they still are all about keeping your beverages hotter or colder than any other product ever created. Aside from being the leader in hot and cold, Stanley has always been the right choice when it comes to the planet. If you're still using single-use plastics for your beverages, it's time to make a change for the environment, and I'm going to make it easier than ever to do. Head on over to stanley-pmi.com, buy some stuff, 
And when you check out, enter the code POWELL, the number 30, all one word, and you're done. You'll get 30% off your entire order. My next sponsor is new to the show, but 686 has been a fixture in the world of snow and independently owned, which is a rarity these days, since 1992. When it comes to technical outerwear, 686 is known for pushing the boundaries of design and construction. The fit and function of my 686 gear is better than anything I've ever owned. And what I'm quickly learning is that 686 gloves are hands down the best, most durable gloves I've ever used. From their industry-leading pre-curve fit to the mobile phone-friendly sound touch forefinger and thumb, 686 has thought of all the details. But don't just take it from me. 686 gloves are the only thing you'll find on the hands of athletes like Forrest Bailey, Parker White, Sammy Lubke, Matt Belzeal, and Olympic silver medalist Kyle Mack. And in 2020, 686 has added three more amazing riders to the glove mitt team. Hannah Beeman, Laurent Demartin, and Gigi Roof, who will be putting out a signature model. You can find 686 gloves and outerwear at 686.com and finer retailers around the globe. Those are my sponsors. Now let's get back into the podcast. Speaking of other cards, do you still have the 60 Impala that I think you got through a sponsorship deal? Yes, the 60. I still have the 60. The SS, yeah. Is that how a company pays you? Is like, hey, we're just going to give you this car? (laughs) Pretty much. (laughs) Back in the old days of Bad Boy Club. Yeah, we were doing our thing and I was sponsored, you know, as a bad boy and all this and movies had come out and this is and that's and we were doing promos and we used to just kind of go down there and, you know, cut stupid deals. And we were sitting there one time and it was like, so where are we at? What, what are we going to do? And I told Mark and Brian Simo and then Beaver Theodoskis, who went, uh, went ahead and uh, started Prana later on. And I said, I think I'm going to drive the black 60 home. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, okay, that's cool. Cause they had three of them at the time. So yeah, I, I, I drove the 60 home and, and I still have it. Awesome. And then what about all the old Cadillacs that I feel like I saw you in in ads back in the day? The only Cadillac that I have is the old 64. I still have the one from the poster. Okay. And how about any other standout cars? Do you have anything that we wouldn't have seen? You know, I got the cars, you know, whatever. They're kind of fun. And and the 60 sits there. The old Lemo's still, you know, out and about. But most of the toys that I kind of have that I'm proud of are, you know, my old boats. You know, I have my old hot rod boats. Okay. I guess back to that question of, Name something that most people don't necessarily know. My hidden talent is I love and collect vintage flat bottoms and, you know, old V-drive hot rod boats. I've got four of those. Cars don't really intrigue me that much because all you do is get in trouble and get a ticket. Where the boats, on the other hand, we play with them at the lake. You water ski behind them, you know, and if you got to work on the boat, you know, you're knee deep in the water, not standing on some hot piece of asphalt. So the old hot rod boats, I still got quite a few of those, and those are really, really fun. I love working on them and love putting them together. I love resurrecting them. And now I, I've gotten a couple of them for friends of mine. I see them left for dead out in the desert, and I'll buy them and take them to friends' houses and drop them off in their yard. And they're like, what is that? And I'll be like, it's your new boat. And they're like, that thing's a pile of junk. And I'm like, just look at it and think about it for a second. Just give it some time. And next thing you know, they call me back going, so where'd that thing come from? And what's going on? And that thing's really cool. You know, all it needs is some TLC. I'm like, I know. That's why I dropped it off at your house. Because I found it left for dead out in the desert and cut a deal, you know, went horse trading. So that's kind of fun. You know, we play with those. And I like them, you know, because we water ski behind them. We foot behind them. We have a blast. I love lake life. I love it. I love all the things we do, whether we're camping or playing in the boats or going fast in boats or water skiing or barefooting and all these darn different things that we do. And to be honest, the boats, other than our nautique that we use for our tournament course, every other boat I have isn't probably worth a thousand bucks. And I just see all these like giant wakeboard boats and all these giant boats that everybody's got. And I think they kind of miss the plot a little bit. I feel sad because It's just so fun, and it has nothing to do with the $120,000 that you need to spend. I know. It's so crazy, and then you have to spend a lot more maintaining them and keeping them somewhere in the winter. Yeah, I mean, our old boat, you know, my old Aquacraft doesn't even have a transmission. You turn the key, it goes. (laughs) (laughs) But anyways, yeah, that's kind of, yeah, I got the hot rod. Yeah, whatever. I like playing with those things. What's the dumbest thing that you've ever done behind the wheel of a car? 
probably looking back as this doing stuff at the old 59. There's a whole bunch of dents along the front fenders. My buddies that do auto body are like, why are all these weird dents on this front fenders? Because back then they was stamped, you know, the steel was pretty thick. They're like, what the heck? Does somebody even beat on this car? And it's, they're actually, all those dents are from running over mailboxes. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so that's kind of a dumb thing, I guess. I don't know. No, it is a dumb thing, but it's fun when you're a kid. <laughs> Yeah, a totally dumb thing. <laughs> there was this railroad track out by the house here. We used to try to get the limo up to 100 and hit it so you could catch air. That's pretty stupid looking back. <laughs> 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 With me, it's doing something dumb, trying to make something actually get somewhere, as opposed to like risking life and limb or others. <laughs> With Cars comes your other gig as a television dude, and you're talking about gearhead shit on Truck Night in America, yeah. and I'm not really into cars. I don't think Jews really fix them that much from what I know. <laughs> Have you ever met a Jewish guy who knows the ins and outs of a motor? I'm trying to think. I'm, I'm sure there's a couple. Yeah, there's got to be I one know. or two. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't think there were many, and you you don't know of any, but your ski dreams came true pretty early. But with yeah. Truck Night, did you ever think there would be another path where you could follow one of your other passions and make money doing it? No, it just kind of came about. And to be honest, as, as fun as that was and as inspiring as it was to see, you know, there's something about freaking cars and trucks or bikes. You know, we have our, these, these kind of weird possessions. And I don't care if you're a motorhead or not. You could be the biggest freaking hippie in the world. I don't care. But you probably have some attachment to your stupid Subaru that's rusted out. You probably got some name for it. And you have all these adventures that you and this car have gone on. And the same thing for all of us, you know, that race cars or build boats and stuff. I mean, I got buddies that refer to their race cars as the freaking whore, you know? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I tend to think mine's a little more my pride and joy. But anyway, <laughs> being involved in truck night was neat because, you know, we all have this interaction to our vehicles, right? Again, whether it's your car that you're going to commute to work in every day, or on another hand, it's something that you've had for 20 something years and you've been building it and recreating it and building it and recreating it since you were young. And all of a sudden, you know, there's this place on TV where you actually can show off what you've done with this thing. And most of the people, 99% of them had no competitive experience whatsoever, had no idea what they got themselves into. And yet here they were taking their pride and joy, their personal equipment, their personal passion, and taking it somewhere where they probably wouldn't take it on a normal basis. For me, it was a real honor to help guide them through that path and be a part of that. It was super, super cool. Unfortunately, production started arguing with network both of them started playing poker with each other and the next thing you know production loses a job and network loses a program and unfortunately that's what i learned out of the deal just how tv kind of is just a weird weird one man it's a weird one i enjoy it i wholeheartedly would love to be more involved in it and continue to go but at the moment they have not ordered a season three and to be honest is happy and as enlightened I was that my motorhead passions were in fact going to be something that I got to do at the same time. It's literally one of the lowest points of my career too, because it was such a fun thing to be a part of on a personal note. And then for it to just be tossed around by a bunch of freaking executives, I take things too serious. That's my problem. I care too much. Okay. And I once did a photo shoot over at OCC when I was with K2, that's the motorcycle place. And when mm -hmm. I was there, I kind of learned that a lot of the things that I thought were happening for real on TV were actually staged and they weren't really fabricating stuff. And right. they just did it to make it look good on TV. Was it like that with your show or was it all real? No. And that was the problem with our show. Our show was all real. You can't fake a competition. When somebody endos their Jeep end over end, you know, they backflip a Jeep off of a 30 foot cliff. That can't really be redone. That happens. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I think that was another thing that the television networks just couldn't handle. And I kept telling them, you guys, 
You got five vehicles. You've got five individuals. You've got four hosts. You've got all this natural environment about you. Let it happen and then tell the story. That's what we did when we made Blizzard. That's what I've done my whole career. And TV can't deal with what's going to happen. They got to know what's going to happen. They got to create what's going to happen. And I'm like, create the environment and then let it be. And they couldn't deal with it. They couldn't deal with it. It's really funny. I'm like, there's going to be plenty happening. And they can't live with that. I think that was another reason why they had a hard time with the show. But at the same time, looking back, I got all these little kids. I got wives. I got husbands. I got daughters. I got everybody going, your show is the only thing we sat down and watched as a family together on TV. And that, to me, means a lot. At the same time, I had a television executive say, well, we kind of missed the demographics for the show. We weren't looking for a family show. Yeah, there you go. And I'm kind of like, ah, well, that's great. Good for you, clowns. If that's the reason you don't want to do another one, I'm happy to be associated with that. But it was cool. It was fun. I think it opened up some eyes, some some people. I had the winningest record. I won more than any of the other coaches. Not that that mattered. But, you know, a lot of people are like, what's that freaking long-haired freaking hippie dude on the show for? And then slowly but surely people realize, that guy kind of knows what he's talking about. And even the other coaches, we had a lot of fun. When it was all said and done, we didn't make no money, but we all looked at each other, me and Bender, when we got hired on that thing. I go, dude, if none of this works out at all, I want to come back from Georgia with a freaking sore face from laughing my ass off for six weeks. And he's like, okay, I can, I, I'll agree to that deal. <laughs> and that's what we did. We laughed our asses off for five or six weeks. <laughs> and you never laugh. <laughs> no, uh-uh. try not to. Gives you wrinkles, apparently. <laughs> so that shows a passion project, but I'm sure it's also another source of income. And yeah. in terms of money, does TV pay better than skiing for you? I was on the verge of it, to be honest. If we had another season, it would have probably been because all of a sudden I was looking forward to taking everything that the ski industry taught me about product endorsement and public appearances. The ski industry has prepped me well for anything, whether it's, you know, let's face it, anybody in the ski industry is a jack of all trades. We all do more than we're supposed to do, regardless of what our field is. You know, in the ski industry, we're always, we're always swimming, right? Yeah. Or we're not around, but you got to swim. That's just the way the ski industry works. And because of that, it set me up well. Uh, you know, we're sitting on set and you're doing long 16 hour days out in the sun. So physically and uh, environmentally, I was perfectly prepped for the world of television. And I just could not wait to, let's say, have the personal aspect of it to show them what a skier can do in this world, as opposed to some friggin' TV dude that's getting paid some crazy appearance fee to stand and ignore people and say he's signing or she's signing autographs and some public appearance. I wanted to show them my version of it because I'm very proud of my version of it. And I think if we had a season three, we, we would have gotten there. And unfortunately, uh, we kind of just ended up just shy of it. It was right there. I was, was just starting to get the phone calls from some third party endorsement type stuff. And, and I was really looking forward to that opportunity for several reasons. One, because it would have made more people aware of not necessarily my skiing, but skiing in general. Cause skiing is what's given me everything. And so if I can go out and get a broader audience and they go, well, that's that skier guy or something. Well, then I'm still swinging my skis over my shoulder, right? Yeah. And if I can make skiing or expose skiing or expose my career or skiing to a, a broader audience, that makes skiing better in my eyes. And I was really looking forward to that. And it was cool to see who was like from my skiing career and who was from my truck night career. It was funny. There was a bunch of little kids at the racetrack. We were there and I was riding my bicycle around, a little BMX bike around. They were like, hey, you want to come to our camp? I'm like, yeah, I'll go to your camp. We're hanging out. And they were all truck night fans. And I asked the parents finally, I go, so are you guys skiers? The parents go, I actually am a skier. I go, boy, they sure like truck night. Yeah, I go, are they skiers? And he goes, no, they actually aren't skiers. And and one of these days, I'll tell them who you really are. (laughs) (laughs) At the same time, a buddy of mine, It was his birthday, so I put my mohawk up for his birthday, and I was announcing this big truck event, and the next day, I didn't have my mohawk up, and this guy comes up to me and goes, hey, you're that guy from Truck Night. You're one of the coaches. I said, yeah. He goes, yeah, yesterday you had that big mohawk. I didn't recognize you. (laughs) (laughs) 
That is How funny. How funny is that, dude? <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. That was a good one. I was laughing my head off on that one. It's time for me to take my last sponsor break, and I'm going to start out with Spy Optic. For 25 years, Spy has been making the best sunglasses and goggles on the market. Yeah, there's a lot of good products out there, but no other lens on the market comes close to Spy's contrast and mood-enhancing happy lens. Don't believe me? Next time you're at the shop, try a bunch of goggles on, and then put on a pair of Spies. You'll see the difference. Another thing you can see is how much better Spy goggles look compared to the competition. I keep thinking the other brands will catch up and fit and finish, but they don't. For listening to the show, I'm going to make it easier than ever for you to rock a pair of Spy goggles, sunglasses, whatever. All you need to do is go to spyoptic.com, do your shopping, and when you check out, use the code POWELL20, that's all one word, and you'll get 20% off your order. My final sponsor is the 10 Barrel Brewery out of Bend, Oregon. They have been brewing my favorite Northwest beer since 2006, and since they started brewing beer, they've been supporting the sports we love. If you aren't sure about what 10 Barrel's been doing in the action sports space, well, I'll tell you. This year, they produced a ski movie with Lucas Wax called Watch This. They produced a snowboard movie with Curtis Cizik called Hold My Beer. They have signature beers that donate to causes like Protect Our Winners. And they have the dates ready for this year's Hella Big Air events, which are a party on the snow and have some big prize money for the riders. The first event is at Copper on March 2nd. Next up, it's Bachelor March 28th. And everything closes out with a new stop at Mount Hood Meadows on April 18th. If all of that isn't cool enough, the people at Ten Barrel, they're all skiers, snowboarders, and bikers. So next time you head to the store, buy some Ten Barrel and support the brand that really makes a difference in the sports we love. Those are my sponsors. Now let's get back into the podcast. We've talked about your younger days being filled with trouble. At 14, I think you yeah. stole a case of beer. You got caught and got probation. <laughs> At 18, yeah. 19, you're using a stolen credit card and got 30 days. Then you have all the drug charges that we talked about that were resolved and more jail time in 89. Getting shot at. <laughs> yeah, getting shot at. <laughs> yeah, that was that was during that. Yeah. But you clean your shit up drug wise because you have a bright future. Yeah. And this is around the time that you meet Kimberly and you're in and out yeah. of jail, I think, in the beginning with her. Yeah. And you're still drinking when you guys first meet. Does she drink too? No. Uh. Uh-uh. She grew up Southern Baptist. And- she started drinking a little bit during college. That's what you do, right? Yeah. But it certainly wasn't really in her history. And I, I'm just so lucky that when it was time for me to stop, it wasn't really much for her to stop because it really wasn't in her culture anyways. It's funny. I ran into a buddy of mine last week. A buddy of mine plays in a metal band and we grew up together, but we hadn't seen each other in a couple of years. And we were just laughing about how we would never turn our back on where we grew up and in the culture or the environment we grew up on. But we also found it to be funny that when everybody else started, let's say, drinking or doing drugs and all these different things, was when we quit. (laughs) (laughs) And it's just kind of funny to think about that because I'd way rather attack those problems and live that lifestyle being young than to try to do it in a more mature age. I couldn't imagine. I see people in a more mature age doing the things that I did when I was between 13 and 24, I couldn't imagine what it must be like. It all ends for you. You getting clean and sober totally around 92. I think you're married to Kimberly. You're in Jackson, Wyoming, and you're partying. I don't know if Kimberly's with you or not on that trip, but you have a huge night and you wake up the next morning in jail with three felonies hanging over your head. What happens the night before? Uh, I was just carrying on with a bunch of patrollers and Hanging out of the old Jackson Hole boom, boom room with the boys. And, you know, we had a bunch. <laughs> One thing led to another. I thought I was just carrying on, right? Jackson Hole, right? Rough and tumble Western town, isn't it? Yeah. And the next thing you know, we got to fight out and I'm in trouble. So That was your last hurrah? Did Kimberly give you an ultimatum? Yeah, that was my last hurrah. That was it. It was the end of it. And was that her saying, hey, you can't be like this anymore? Or were you realizing, hey, I got better grow up? No, it was it was the end of it. It was very mutual at that point. Like, we got an issue here. Let's stop. The problem was I was doing all these promotions. I was out doing all these different things, you know, and still to this day, you know, everybody else out on holiday, but we're actually living it. You know, we do it every day. So you do one promotion, you'd go to another promotion, you'd go here, you go there, you do this after a ski, you do another after a ski, you go to that party, you go to that trade show, you got to go this. Real simple. 
Next thing you know, you look back, you go, geez, I just drank for a week straight or we partied for a week straight, whatever it ended up being, right? Yeah. So it was catching up. Even if you were at home, you'd go out on the weekends or something and carry on and go, man, that was terrible. I'll never do that again. And I was doing it every day. And I wasn't a rock star. I was a skier. I was supposed to be some athlete. I actually had to do stuff. I had physical ability that I had to live up to. And you're freaking shaking from the damn alcohol. You know, so uh, it, it was time and we thought about it. And then obviously that happened. And I look back and it, it's a bit of a giggle. You know, this kind of fight breaks out. I never named any of the people who I was with. You know, for a long time there, I kind of had carte blanche with Jackson Hole Ski Patrol and a bunch of others because everybody knew I was with Ski Patrol, but I never copped out. I'm proud to say that it, I was, in fact, with Big Wally. He has since passed on, but that's who I was with that night. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, kind of funny. Who are you with? I'm like, I don't know. He was a ski patroller. He had a mustache. <laughs> <laughs> I knew who I was with. <laughs> but anyways, while I certainly support anybody's sobriety program, and I had to go do some of the stuff to fulfill court obligations and stuff. But anyways, I'm not going to say anything about anybody's uh, path to sobriety, but I stopped that night. Yeah, well, it sounds like you were getting in trouble a bunch. And if you get in trouble a bunch, your freedom is at risk. It was real simple to find the source of my problems. For sure. And I think in our other podcast, you know, we've covered a lot of your life and times. We've talked about the down home yeah. tour. We've talked about a bunch of stuff. Yeah. So we really don't need to bring all of that stuff up. Yeah, no big deal. It's out there. Google it. But one thing I notice with you is whenever I see a poster that's signed by Plake from like the 90s and even probably today, a lot of times you'll see like, I love America, Jesus and this. And are you a religious guy? Yeah. I'm not going to sit and say I sit on a deacon bench, but yeah, religion is in my life. I've been through too much stuff to say that it doesn't exist, and I don't like to, let's say, have to question anything as far as direction that my life might be going or where it's been, and so I kind of forfeit it all, and I'm just along for the ride. We all are just along for the ride. And you're not outwardly, other than signing posters, I've never heard anything about God or anything come out of your mouth that much. So it's not like you're Russell Wilson pushing beliefs on people. Oh, no, no. Is Kimberly more religious than you? Is that where some of this comes from? Again, Kimberly grew up in the church. I didn't go to church at all until after I met Kimberly. Okay. When we got married, we had a preacher conduct our wedding. And, you know, he had some conversations with me going, you know, do you understand why you are getting married? Do you understand what marriage is? Do you understand this? And kind of expose me to some of those Bible definition of what a marriage is and, and you know, and what I thought about this and what I thought about that. Because we weren't married in a church. Huh? We were married at Mono Lake. But I was married at Mono Lake for a reason. It's a prehistoric lake. It's been around for a very, 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 very long time. One of the oldest things I know about certainly in my disposal. And it, it's ever-changing. It's a very beautiful place to, to sit and watch as it goes through the changes of the day or the season. So we chose the shores of Mono Lake for kind of that timeless reasons. But at the same time, I'll be really honest to say that I was, at the time, probably worshipping the creation versus the creator. And I think a lot of people tend to do that, especially in the outdoor world. You know, we tend to look at the natural beauties and build upon them as opposed to, wait a minute, who may have made that happen? <laughs> okay. And, you know, speaking of Kimberly, she's your lovely wife, business manager, yes. the person that I reach out to when I want to connect with you. And I feel like you two are like yeah. one person. You're funnier. She's better <laughs> looking. <you. laughs> and I want to see if I can get her on the line to talk to her for a few minutes and find out some of her backstory. Yeah. So. Reality is she's still out talking to our neighbors. She's sitting in a warm pickup truck right now. Uh, <laughs> but I can go grab her and she's looking forward to having a chat with you. And then, honestly, Kimberly said I had a lot to talk about yeah. or something. And it's because she's been hearing me bitch and moan the last, let's say, couple of weeks. 
<laughs> well, she's stuck in a truck with you. I'm sure you spend every waking minute of every hour together. No, we were just talking about I'm extremely frustrated. I love the down-home tour. I absolutely love the down-home tour. I go to these funky little ski areas, and I see how they live, and I see how they come, and I see the business plan that makes them work, and none of them, none of them are the same. They all got their own story. They all got this thing, and they all got that. And yet, there's no new ski areas being built anywhere at all in the United States. There's no new ski lifts being built anywhere in the United States. There are very, very few accessible points for stewardship to backcountry skiing anywhere. Everything's smashed up against some dang wilderness designation. Everything's smashed up against some use permit. When Alpine Meadows was turned into a ski area, they filed for permit in April and they opened for business in December. Okay. Here we are skiing around and I love Dave McCoy and I love everything about him and I love everything about every pioneer that's ever started a dang ski area. But to be very honest, those are 60 year old ideas. Yeah. And when are we going to be able to make an opportunity? When are we ever? I mean, obviously we were born in the worst generation ever for skiing. We didn't get to build ski areas. We had to put up with the, let's say, golf course development era when they were, in fact, building ski areas. Kind of funny. I mean, we go on, you know, we, we, we went through the no jumping phase. Remember that? That was fun. We went through the liability phase. We went through this queue. And I just find it interesting now, and I'm going to bite my own freaking, I'm going to shoot my own foot because I am sponsored by Mammoth Mountain. I am an ambassador for Mammoth Mountain. And they are, in fact, owned by Altera. But I just find it interesting that we have public land that is controlled by some big business. I think it's interesting that the Forest Service is allowing a lot of things to take place, and yet nothing new being created. And if, in fact, wilderness areas are wilderness areas, and we're saving them for the next generation, well, I know a lot of seven- and eight-year-olds out there, are, do they get to build ski areas? Do they get to build backcountry yurts? Do they get to build, do they get to do anything creative in the forest? Or do we, in fact, just got to sit around, load up the pack horses, and load up the mules with the stakes? And obviously, back then in 1964, when the rules were made with our whiskey and our cigarettes, and head out into the outdoors. But that's not what we do anymore. We're into ski touring. We're into climbing. We're into all these wonderful things. We have these stupid things called bicycles that can, in fact, ride on the dirt. And yet, I can stand on a wilderness border, have a monster truck show with Metallica playing, and step two feet to the inside of that line, and I'm not allowed to ride a bicycle. Yeah, it's crazy. It's absurd. It's absolutely absurd. I can be in a so-called wilderness area and hear Jake breaks from a highway from the trucks going down the hills. The wilderness area is obviously somewhere else. While I'm a big fan of, you know, protecting our lands and what have you, I want to freaking use them. And it's just crazy that we're living in this era. And then the only land that we are allowed to use is in fact controlled by big business. And it's just kind of weird. I just wish there was a way to have some other things going on. And, and again, it's I'm blowing my own horn and it's not going to happen in my life. But every little kid that I talk to, I go, you do something for me <laughs> before you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just funny. I just think we need to relook really at what we considered the Wilderness Act back in the 60s and take a look at it. I mean, I can just think of a whole bunch of, you know, there's all this stewardship. Everybody wants to go backcountry skiing. I'm working my ass off to go get my guide certification. Other people have already gotten their guide certifications. They've invested tons of money in the education and the skills to be good stewards, to show people something that they can't achieve by themselves. And yet, we can't develop an infrastructure to expose that to the public. And that's what you've been venting to, to Kimberly, for the past seven weeks yeah. in your vehicle? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it just makes me mad. I'm going to go out and just start painting wilderness boundaries so people can see how absurd the lines really are when you look at them. And, and around Mammoth Area. So there was a wilderness area developed eight years ago, eight freaking years ago, and it has destroyed 
every opportunity that that land could have had from here on until eternity. Only because a bunch of people got all hotted up like 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and said, oh, we need to stop the building of the ski areas and blah, blah, blah. We got to protect this and the evil, blah, 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 blah. But they didn't have the foresight to think, I wonder if ski touring will get popular. And that would be a responsible, like, cool way to access all that area. But no, they were so short-sighted in their ways. Now you can't do nothing. It's a wilderness area. And yet, in that same wilderness area, there's a 150-foot wide road that goes right through the middle of it. You're like, well, wait a minute, I thought this was a wilderness area. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> I don't want to be an activist. I freaking hate activists. I'm an anti-activist. <laughs> <laughs> but all these people, got, can you take us into the backcountry? No, I can't. I don't have a permit. No, I cannot. I cannot professionally take you out there. I'm sorry. Good luck. Isn't there avalanche danger? Maybe. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well, how do you get out there? I don't know. I don't know. We used to go out there, but now it's a six-mile walk from the road. Well, that's a long way. Yeah, I know. It's not even worth it. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> it's just funny. I don't know. And maybe the mountain bikers, maybe somebody will bust the freaking barrier down. But yeah, just, the, you know, the laws that were written a long time ago and the ideas. Again, dude, isn't it funny? Think about it, dude. Your kid is skiing at a ski area that was developed 60-something years ago. What are we doing that's, that's 60 years old? My 60 Impala? That's not as nice of a car as you can go get right now. Trust me. You go get a new Hyundai that's way cooler. <laughs> <laughs> as far as ability and driving around, whatever the heck, you know. I've just been tripping out on it, actually. It's funny. All right, Glenn, at this point in the show, and I'm, I'm, gonna, no, I'm cutting you off. I'm sorry. I don't mean to, but I know you'd go on for a while. When you do your environmental podcast, call me up. <laughs> So at this point in the show, Glenn, I have something called inappropriate questions. And I get some Oh yeah, yeah. And I get someone that you know to ask three inappropriate questions. And okay. I was able to get an amazing <laughs> person to ask questions. I think you knew him when he was a little boy and he grew up from little Bradley into bad boy Brad Holmes. No way, badass. This is cool. All right. So I'm going to let Brad, Brad talks for a little bit in the beginning, and then he asks you a question. So I'm going to play question number one for you from Brad Holmes. Oh, uh, this is so freaking cool. Thanks for, yeah, this is badass. Cool. What's up? I kind of just did some stupid lead ups into it. You know, out of all my friends in the world, he's probably the most appropriate, you know? Like when I want to get my shit together, I go hang out with play. So I really had to dig deep and then. All the stuff that's kind of heavy, I didn't really want to bring up. Plake, it's Holmes. I'm going to a huge party tonight and wanted to make a good impression. I was wondering if you had any party tricks from back in the day. I heard you used to do one called Shoot the Winkle. Can you walk me through that? Thanks, man. <laughs> yeah, okay. So the party trick that Brad is requesting is not called Shoot the Winkle. It's actually called Spit the Winkle. It was shown to me by a couple of Australian friends my first years in Chamonix. Uh, if you want to see it live, then you need to go watch the opening of the Guatemalan Persuader. You will see it done and performed live onto a glass sliding door. The procedure is you unscrew the head of the shower with the hose on it and basically do a recreational enema. <laughs> <laughs> I like to use lukewarm water and obviously you cannot laugh at all whatsoever cuz any abdominal motion while you quote unquote tank up <laughs> <laughs> will in fact result in you uh, letting it all go on the floor before you get a chance to creatively spit the winkle be it Onto a sliding glass door, off of a balcony, onto a street. <laughs> How many times have you spit the winkle? Oh, uh, I don't know. Many times. More than you can count, for sure. <laughs> it could go far. You'd be surprised. I mean, you, you spit the winkle 20, 30 feet, no problem. <laughs> and everybody should watch The Guatemalan Persuader, one of the greatest ski movies of all time. Do you remember the opening The Guatemalan Persuader? I will never forget it. 
I've watched that movie about 50 times. I love it. And that part is the worst part. That's spit the winkle. Dude, I watched Guatemalan for Sweater and Burger Time in Chamonix two years ago with like all the men's downhill team. It was so friggin' cool. We forgot. That's a crazy ass time to be a friggin' rail rider. Nobody had a clue what they were doing. It was so friggin' reckless, dangerous. Those two bodies of work. I'm so happy that Mercon was able to document that time in our sport because that was some crazy days, boy. Trust me. Yes, they were. And I'm going to go to question number two from Brad. Brad Holmes. Here we go. Plank, I'm at the bar having some beers and some appetizers. It got me to thinking about back in the day when you used to eat rotisserie chicken asses. Out of all the places you've been in the world, what's the most disgusting thing you've ever eaten? The most disgusting thing I've ever eaten? Hmm. I don't know. I can think of some disgusting things that Kimberly's eaten, but I... Uh... <laughs> I leave that stuff alone, man. I think it's not so much disgusting, but like when you start on expeditions, I don't ever want to get sick on expeditions. The first three days, I'm like only drinking water that I brought and I'm washing my hands like constantly and I'm only eating like dry pretzels that I bought and I'm eating two or three Pepto-Bismols a day and I'm like just constantly like trying to not get sick in any way, shape or form. And as you, you know, ease yourself into a different world's diet and culture and for that matter sanitary procedures by the end of the trip you're pulling into any truck stop you look at <laughs> and eating i don't even know you're like yeah whatever that guy is having and i don't even know what i'm eating to be honest <laughs> so that would be uh yeah that would be it all right we will jump into brad's final question plank i just had 25 beers I'm in the Squaw Valley parking lot, which, by the way, is way better than Mammoth. We're putting in a water park. This place rules. Anyway, it reminds me of back in the day when you and Darren Johnson used to clip tickets. It's kind of a lost art form. Can you tell us some techniques involved with clipping tickets back in the day? Love you, Plague. <laughs> oh, man. I tell you what. I don't want to sound like a hopeless romantic or a back in the day, old school or something. But let me tell you, there was so many tricks to ski for free. <laughs> and every day you were just, it was like your toolbox. You were just constantly digging into the toolbox and seeing what you needed to do and grabbing the right tool or technique to make it happen. The simplest and probably most used way to clip the ticket was obviously you walked up and you found somebody that wasn't skiing for the rest of the day. And it's probably why I'm not a big fan of early morning skiing because you couldn't clip tickets till later in the day, you know? <laughs> I think to this day, everybody's like, you going up for first run? I'm like, no, no, no. I'll probably catch last chair, but no, first chair, I could care less, really. <laughs> Anyways, the procedure would be, you know, hey, you threw skiing for the day. And, yeah. You, you mind if I take that ticket off you? and and most of the time, I was like, well, how are you going to get it off? And you're like, well, I got to sit aside cutters here. So you'd cut it off and then you'd have your ticket. You had all sorts of different responses. You know, well, what are you going to use them for? Oh, well, one of the bars in town gives us, you know, free drinks if you have a lift ticket. Oh, okay. That sounds good. You know, or, <laughs> you know, the funniest ones were people were like, are you going to be able to use that the rest of the day? And you're like, I kind of intended to. And they're like, well, that's great. Yeah. Here you can have it. And so you get your ticket and then you go back to the car. And you would use starting fluid and you would spray the starting fluid onto the ticket and that would momentarily dissolve the glue. And then you'd have a new wicket and you kind of had a, a collection of wickets because they had different shapes. And then you'd lay the wicket back in exactly. The ticket checkers would punch holes in the tickets like it'd be a T or an X or, you know, you have these little funny things that punch a hole through the ticket. So you had to line all that up real nice and perfect. And then you'd put it on your, you know, on your pants or your jacket or whatever. And then you, you know, you'd be ready to go. That would be one of the easier ways to clip tickets. But then you had to be careful because people started getting wise to the starting fluid and it never happened to me, but there was instances of people actually smelling the ticket, you know, and like, you know, they could smell the ether a little bit and then people getting busted for clipping. 
Another technique that I used to use a lot was if for some reason you could get a special ticket, you know, like a green ticket or a special ticket, and you kind of had a little bit of a persona to yourself because you'd have this comp ticket. Because sometimes you could get away with wearing that one a couple of days in a row because they wouldn't realize, they'd just see the ticket and you'd have to play it off pretty fast. Another technique that we'd use is you'd clip some tickets and you'd leave them sitting out in the sun in the window. You know how old tickets are. You know, they had like letters on there, right? HF, yep. you know, whatever the code was for the day. And you'd try to clip one that didn't have a very good code, like it, for whatever reason, it missed the stamp. So you'd let that thing sit out in the sun for a couple of days. And believe it or not, the ink would go away. So you ended up with just a blank ticket. And you would clip that now blank ticket and you'd take care of that thing, dude. You'd put that thing in your freaking pocket. Because basically now you got a season pass. Whoa. <laughs> and you would pull that thing out. They'd be like, hey, man, you, you check your ticket. You'd be like, yeah. Why doesn't it have any number? You'd be like, I don't know. That was funny, huh? Yeah, they must have missed that one. Oh, well. And off you go. And you had to have some penache. I mean, you just couldn't be like, huh, what? Because uh, now you're going to get busted for sure. But those are kind of a couple of quick ticket clipping tricks. And it's like legalized marijuana. It's bullshit. What do you clip a ticket now? Hey, you threw skiing for the day. Can I have your three out of five pass? Yeah, here, let me take that off your neck. You know, or, ooh, let me clip that zip tie. <laughs> you miss out on all the sneaking around. We had a lot of fun, man. We'd clip all the time. And it's funny that Brad brings up Darren Johnson because we'd miss our first run in competition sometimes because we couldn't clip a ticket in time to go to compete. <laughs> <laughs> oh man funny hey mike i forgot to tell you you know i was saying i would get the ink to disappear off the tickets and then you could ski on them for days and days and days i was using one of those tickets when i broke my leg and in the ski patrol room they cut your pants off and everything and you know you're laying there and, and the head ski patrol who kind of had a hard on for me anyway said is this the ticket that you're skiing on today? And I said, uh, yeah. <laughs> the thing is probably about a month old, but it was one of them ones I just kept in my pocket all the time. And I don't think they were overly impressed. But another funny thing about me breaking my leg, it was the last day of the year. And during the rescue, it was a bit strange. It was just kind of weird. And I'm not going to say where or who. You, you can figure that out yourself. But... It was a tradition that on the last day of the year, all the ski patrol would take LSD. And here it is, uh, 3.30 in the afternoon, broken leg. I think they were well on to their trips by then. <laughs> and I myself only heard that story uh, in recent years because uh, someone goes, hey, I need to tell you about that day you broke your leg, our version of it. Well, Glenn, I want to thank you for your time. I look at you as everything that's great in skiing. Uh, I mean, your attitude towards everything. You're one of those guys that remembers every person you Thanks. meet. And you dressed up once as the Energizer Bunny at the SIA trade <laughs> show. And that is you, man. You have so much energy and you're so passionate about the sport. You've helped change it for a lot of people. And I thank you for your time, man. It's always great to talk to you. Thanks for the kind words and thanks for the opportunity. I don't know what to say anymore, man. Here I am. <laughs> So that was time with Glenn Plake, and man, I love that guy. He's definitely a talker, and he's not afraid to share his opinions in an unfiltered way, which is refreshing. While Plake has been a pro skier forever, he's so much more than that. There's never been a better ambassador for a sport in a real, non-sugar-coated way than Glenn Plake, and I'm going to do my best to get him on the show every year to share what's going on in his unique mind. That's the show for this week. Now, I want to thank you for listening ask you to review me on whatever platform you listen to me on, and thank my amazing sponsors who make this thing happen. They are Evo, Stanley, 686, Spy Optic, and the Ten Barrel Brewery. Have a great week, everyone. <laughs>